In this video I will be looking at Unit 2 of AS Chemistry and in particular I will be covering properties and reactions of group 2 elements and compounds. And in the end of this video I will be looking at an acid and base titration question. Let's first look at the trend in the first ionization energy. Generally it decreases down the group and this is because the atomic radius is increasing as we go down which means that we are adding electrons to fill higher energy levels. This means that the distance from the positive nucleus and the negative electrons is increasing and therefore the force of attraction is less. As we go down the group the shielding increases. The inner shell electrons shield the two valence electrons from the nucleus which means that further reduction happens in the force of attraction. On the right here we can see the trend as we go from beryllium which is at the top down to barium there is a decrease in the first ionization energy. Reactions of group 2 elements we will look at reactions with oxygen, chlorine and water Reactivity usually increases down the group as the, as the ionization energy decreases. All the group 2 metals burn in air or oxygen to form solid metal oxides and they often burn with a very bright flame. Reactivity increases down the group. In general this can be seen in this example here where we have strontium solid reacting with oxygen gas to, produ to produce strontium dioxide. The same will go for magnesium, calcium and all the other elements in group 2. All the group 2 metals also burn in chlorine to form solid metal chlorides and again in general the reactivity will increase down the group. For example, magnesium solid plus chlorine 2 gas going to magnesium chloride. And the final reaction is with water. Calcium and the elements of the group below it will react with water to form hydrogen and the corresponding hydroxide. So the reactivity increases down the group. So barium solid reacting with water going to barium oxide plus hydrogen gas. There is one exception and that is beryllium. Beryllium does not react with water due to the formation of an insoluble ox oxide layer. Magnesium reacts very slowly with cold water and very vigorously with steam. And when it's reacting with steam it gives the product is magnesium oxide which is almost always insoluble. Reactions of group 2 oxides The group 2 oxides are ionic solids excluding beryllium oxide which has a covalent character. So we have beryllium oxide, magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, strontium oxide and barium oxide. If we look from calcium down the group the oxides will react with water to form the corresponding hydroxide as in this example here. We have calcium oxide solid reacting with water going to calcium oxide which is a solid. And calcium hydroxide has many uses such as waterproof water pure water purification, making whitewash, mortar and plaster. All the other ox oxides of group 2 all the oxides of group 2 neutralize hydrochloric acid and nitric acid to form the corresponding chlorides and nitrates. For example, magnesium oxide reacting with hydrochloric acid will produce magnesium chloride and water. The hydroxides of group 2 
react with dilute acids in a similar way. So strontium oxide reacting with hydrochloric acid will give strontium chloride plus water. The solubility of hydroxides increases down the group. Calcium hydroxide is slightly soluble and in the reaction it gives the product which we know as lime water. The solution then reacts with carbon dioxide to form a white precipitate of calcium carbonate which is CaCO3. If we add more carbon dioxide the solution will clear because, the so because soluble calcium hydrogen carbonate forms. The solubility of sulfates decreases down the group. Calcium sulfate is somewhere in between soluble and insoluble. Barium sulfate is used in x-ray investigations because it is insoluble and so it is not absorbed from the gut. It is very useful in medicine despite being poisonous because barium shows up very well on x -ray. Thermal stability relates to the stability of a compound when it is heated. The general trend is that the carbonates and nitrates of group 1 and 2 follow the same pattern. Magnesium carbonate, solid, being heated, and the products are magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide. Sometimes in the exam we might be asked to show how we would carry out a thermal decomposition. Here I have the apparatus that we would use. We would use a Bunsen burner, a clamp stand which would contain the test tube with the metal carbonate. It would be sealed off. Through it there will be a delivery tube going into lime water through a test tube. Group 1, from sodium down, the carbonates will not decompose. In group 2, both carbonates and the nitrates become more stable because the ionic radius of the positive ion increases down the group and the oxides with the smaller ions are more stable due to the polarization of the oxide ions giving additional covalent bonding. The ease of decomposition decreases down the group. Here we have magnesium 2 plus and here we have calcium 2 plus. Driving force must be the formation of the oxide. The smaller ion with its greater charge density holds onto the O2 minus ion to make a more stable compound. So that is why it is harder to decompose calcium carbonate than it is magnesium carbonate. We also need to know about the thermal decomposition of nitrates. Group 1 from sodium nitrate will decompose to form a nitrite and oxygen as shown here with potassium nitrate. Upon being heated it produces potassium nitrate and oxygen gas. When you're carrying out this experiment be sure not to drop bits of burning splint into the test tube because the mixture may explode. Lithium nitrate and all group 2 nitrates decompose and they produce carbon dioxide and the corresponding oxide. Although we don't need to, to remember the degrees of hydration, if we are given the formula of any nitrate we should be able to write the equation for its thermal decomposition. Here I have an example of magnesium nitrate 6 water being decomposed. We have magnesium oxide solid forming, oxygen gas, nitrogen dioxide and six molecules of water. When we carry out this in the lab, these are the things that we should be seeing. So first, the solid will be dissolving in water of crystallization. The solution will then be boiling and the water condensing on top of the test tube. The solid will then be reforming as the water boils away. The, then the solid melts and finally a brown gas will be given off which is nitrogen dioxide. This will be the gas that can relight a glowing splint. We would use nichrome wire which is which consists of nickel and chromium and it's an alloy and it is very it's used in this experiment because it is very unreactive. We mix the acid and powdered salt and pick up a small sample with the wire. We then hold the coated wire in a Bunsen flame as shown here on the right and the colors that are produced sodium 
we will have a yellow flame. For potassium and cesium, we will have a lilac flame. For lithium, calcium, and strontium, we will have a red flame. For barium, it will be green, and for magnesium, it will be colorless. We might also be asked to, to explain how the colors arise. And this happens because electrons are given energy, so they are promoted to a higher energy level. As shown on the right, we have the electron, the heat that strikes the electron promotes the electron to a higher energy level, and this is known as absorption. When the electron falls back down to the lower energy level, energy is released in the form of visible light. We can see in the bottom part of this picture, as the electron falls back down, light is released. There is one exception, which is magnesium, where the radiation that is released is outside the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. The final part of this video will be looking at acid and base titrations. And an acid and base titration is a technique. We use accurate volume measurements to find the concentration of an acid or an alkali solution. On the left here, you can see the apparatus that we would use for a titration. We would use an acid, such as hydrochloric acid, of known concentration, and it would usually be placed in the burette, which is here. We would then add the alkali into the conical flask to measure out the volume of the alkali. We would use a pipette with a pipette filler. Usually, for an acid and base titration, we would use methyl orange as the indicator unless we're titrating a weak acid. Methyl orange will change the color from yellow in alkali to red in acid, shown here at the bottom. For a weak acid, such as ethanoic acid, we can use this indicator, and it will be pink in alkali and colorless in acid. When we have a very pale pink color, it shows us the end point of the titration. Results of titrations, we will also look at accuracy, precision and reliability. The results of a titration should be recorded in a table, as shown here, where we have we are repeating the titration three, four times until we get a concordant titer. We record the final volume and the initial volume, and then we calculate titer, which is the difference between the final and the initial volume. The first titer is usually inaccurate. It's used as a rough, as a rough indicator of where the endpoint is. This result is usually discarded. We record the titers to the nearest 0 0.05 cubic centimeters, and this gives us the limit of the precision of the burette. Number of significant figures or decimal places that can be read. To improve reliability, we can repeat the titration two, three times until we get a concordant titer, which is within 0 0.20 cubic centimeters. If we have to discard an anomalous titer, we need to justify by saying, for example, if it's too high, that we have overshot. Once we have two or three concordant titers, we can find the mean. When we are carrying out titrations, we need to eliminate, eliminate systemic errors as far as possible. So these can be caused by poor technique. So make sure when you are reading off the burette that the burette is at eye level. You should also check that the burette jet is filled and remove the funnel used when you are filling your burette. Measurement uncertainties are caused by random errors. So and which is caused by the limits of accuracy of the apparatus. So if we repeat the experiment, we will definitely make the results more reliable, but the uncertainty will remain the same if the same apparatus was used. Also, make sure that you are giving your answers to the appropriate number of significant figures. In acid and base titration questions, we are almost always asked to estimate the uncertainty in the final answer, which also is referred to as an error boundary. To calculate the percentage uncertainty, we can use this equation here, where we 
divide the uncertainty in the, in the value by the value and then times it by 100%. We are asked to find the solubility of calcium hydroxide given that 10 cubic centimeters of saturated calcium hydroxide was found by titration to neutralize 6.10 cubic centimeters of 0 0.050 molar hydrochloric acid. To start off with, we need to find the number of moles. We need to multiply the volume by the concentration. In this case, the concentration is this number here, 0, 0.0. We need to multiply that by this number, but we also need to remember that the volume has to be in decimeters cubed, therefore this number has to be divided by a thousand. Moles of hydrochloric acid, 3.05 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. We then can use the stoichiometry of the equation to find out the moles of calcium hydroxide. In this question we're not given the equation, so we have to come up with it ourselves. If we look at the question we are told that we have calcium hydroxide, which is aqueous. We also know that it's reacting with hydrochloric acid, therefore we have HCl also aqueous. In acid and alkali reaction we always produce water, which we put there. We have calcium and chlorine left. Calcium chloride will form, which is also aqueous. We also need to make sure we balance the equation to of the hydrochloric acid and to balance the water. So this is our balanced equation. So we know the moles of hydrochloric acid and we want to find the moles of calcium hydroxide. So we can see from the stoichiometry that the ratio is 2 to 1. Therefore we need to divide this number by 2. So we will get 1.525 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of calcium hydroxide. This number here is the number of moles of calcium hydroxide in 10 cubic centimeters. We now know the moles of calcium hydroxide and we have the volume, which means we can now calculate the concentration. Multiply moles times the volume, which in this case will be 1.525 times 10 to the minus 4 times the volume of calcium hydroxide, which is 10 centimeters cubed. But again, we need to remember to divide this by 1000 to get decimeters cubed, which gives us 1.53 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per decimeter cubed. This gives us the concentration, but the question is asking us to find the solubility. And solubilities are usually expressed in grams per decimeter cubed. We therefore need to convert this number into grams per decimeter cubed. In order to do that, we need to multiply the concentration by the molar mass of calcium hydroxide. 1.53 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per decimeter cubed times the molar mass of calcium hydroxide, which is 74.1 grams per mole, which gives us 1.13 grams per decimeter cubed. So this is the solubility of calcium hydroxide.